Aloha, everyone. It is 6.30. We are going to start on time. I'm Charlene Schulenberg. I'm the president of KCA, and I have all kinds of little announcements that I'm supposed to do before this whole thing starts, and I, I'm like on a time gun, so I'm just going to go for it. First of all, we want to thank Lynn, who is owner-operator of our beautiful Pro Arts here. Did you want to say something? Now is your moment. Hi folks, for uh, anyone that doesn't know about ProArts, we are a nonprofit uh, 501c3 performing arts venue. We have all sorts of things. We do a lot of community programming like this. Uh, we work with a lot of other nonprofits like this. We also have a whole slew of exciting shows, like for instance, this week alone, we've got Dirty Cello, which is a music show. We've got uh, two of our theatrical performers performing in a show of their own uh, on Friday. And then on Saturday, we have the first in what is gonna be our new magic series with David Karaya, the only um, music magician on the island left from Warren and Annabelle's. Uh, so he is going to be performing. And just so you're aware, we do also have a program that I always like to inform people about called Access for All. Uh, it allows us to give buy one, get one free, or entirely free tickets to those in financial need because we want to make sure that the arts remains accessible here on Maui. And thanks to the generosity of the county's uh, OED, as well as Arnold Jacobson and Jennifer Myers, we're able to give unlimited free tickets to anyone displaced by the fires. So if you know somebody who is uh, needs a night out or just needs a great night of entertainment or something, please have them give us a call. And actually, thanks to Barry Kawakami's Wave of Harmony Foundation, for some of our events, we're even able to coordinate transportation from the west side. So thank you very much, and uh, thank you for being here. That's a great program. Thanks for sharing that. Um, the next item is we have a batch of uh, directors here, board of directors. So I'd like our board to please stand, and everybody can give them a quick little hand. And we have some Mary Claus back there, and Patricia's at our desk, John Lainey's back there as well. So we've got a good turnout tonight. Um, wanted to thank you all for remembering to donate to the food bank. Um, we've been doing that how many years? It's, it's a really great program, and I, I read something about it lately that, that they had made some record, you know, hit some record or something, but anyway, really good stuff. Also, uh, we have, here in Kihei, we have something called Stomp Out Hunger. It's this green flyer. Um, Mary Trouto has some, um, and it's basically a 5K run and a one mile walk here in uh, Kihei, and it's on Saturday, October 26th. It's the only quote unquote race that we do here in Kihei. So, um, so there's that. Uh, I am supposed to remember to tell you to please join KCA if you're not a member. Um, you can go to gokihei.org and there's a place to sign up. Uh, there's also a place to sign up for our newsletter if you don't get that. Um, there's a lot of good information on there. So that's that, please join. Uh, it's not very expensive, not at all. Uh, also, we're going to um, be graced with uh, Lauren Armstrong, who is here tonight, and she has a, an update on the water, the water inventory. Okay, so Lauren, you want to go ahead and we'll throw that in now too. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Shar. Aloha everyone, I'm Lauren Armstrong with Brown and Caldwell. Um, I'm joined here by Chris Kim with the County of Maui Department of Water Supply, um, Troy Chang with HDR Engineering, and Irina Constantinescu of Brown and Caldwell, also where I work. Um, so Maui County Department of Water Supply is doing an inventory of the water pipes that serve your homes, schools, and businesses. And this is happening across Maui County. Um, the effort is to comply with the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency lead and copper rule revision from 2021. Um, so as some of you may know, lead can dissolve from pipes 
um, as they corrode, which can cause some serious health problems. Um, Maui Department of Water Supply has programs to minimize the pipe corrosion, and they also sample for lead at the pipes. Um, so these sampling results have shown that there's no cause for concern, there's no lead in the water. Um, this inventory that's happening right now is to is just another step that DWS is taking to provide safe water and to comply with the newest EPA rule. Um, so just a little like quick background on what work has been done so far and what's coming up. Um, so DWS and the contractors, uh, HDR and Brown and Caldwell, have inspected water service lines at 3,500 points in central Maui. Um, the inventory is to categorize the water pipe materials as uh, lead, non-lead, galvanized requiring replacement, or unknown. And so basically uh, the initial inventory is due October 16th and you'll be able to see some of the results on the county website. Um, the inspections will continue through 2025. So what can you expect um, as these crews make their way through the community? Um, so DWS might come onto your property to see the pipe material as it in the external portion of your house. Nobody will ask to enter your house. Um, we do ask that you secure animals um, and remove any items that might block access to the water meter. Uh, inspections will take around 20 minutes to complete and there's no additional cost or charge um, and no interruption to the water service during the inspection. And in the unlikely event that any lead material is found, DWS will contact you and let you know about opportunities for replacement. Um, and then finally, there will be a more in-depth public meeting on this topic on October 18th in Wailuku. Um, it'll be held at 6 p.m. at the Cameron Center. And for more information, we have a flyer that you can grab from our team and you can also visit the DWS website. They have more information about the lead and copper inventory. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you, water people, for coming. <laughs> okay, I am supposed to also mention, because we have bylaws and we try to follow the rules, um, that we have to do what is called a nominating committee to try to find other people who are interested in being board members for KCA. And we're all really nice people, so please think about it. <laughs> so we have um, four people that are going to be helping us, Audrey Lester, Patricia Stilwell, uh, Bob Schaubert, and Randy Wagner. And I think I don't, I, I don't know if we just do like a general vote. Do we have to vote, um, all Mike? Favor, say do we say, oh, all in favor say aye? Aye. <laughs> aye. Okay, sorry, I'm still learning this over. <laughs> um, okay, and there are applications that you will have to fill out if you are interested. You can uh, get the application, it is online, and you just fill it out, and I think you can um, either mail it in or there's a, there's our, I think our web, our web email is on there. Okay, um, and then last but last, not least, uh, you guys might have seen the little table out front. This is a Reshape Maui, a, a wonderful program that Randy Wagner is um, uh, kind of in charge of. And they came up with some t-shirts and some hats. And the really cool thing is on the back it says, keep it cool. And it says that on the, um, the shirt as well. So I believe that they're for sale up front. And um, it's a good cause because everybody just keeps chopping our trees down and we have no shade. <laughs> so anyway, okay, that is it. And I'll turn it over to Bob Schauberg. And I want to thank all our uh, nominees or, or our, app, or what are you called? Yes. Your candidates, candidates. Um, <coughs> candidates, thank you for coming. Be, be nice to them.
Okay. Thank you both very much for coming. Appreciate it a whole deal. Lots, lots of lots of good stuff happening. Um, and uh, as I think you both know, Billy, do you need them to change the lights a little bit? <laughs> Angel, can you take care of that? Perfect. Okay, we're going to start with opening statements, so that you can go first. Aloha, everyone. I'm Lilia King. I'm running for House Representative for District 11. Um, I decided to run because I've had a lot of my friends ask me to since I've done quite a lot for our community in the last 21 years, and especially after the virus. I have a lot of very close um, generational Lahainian friends that lost everything, including a lot of homes. Um, I am new to this. I don't like politics, but I'm, I'm really wanting to help our community. Um, I've helped with the, developing the tiny home village development plans to help with temporary long-term housing for a displaced. And I've also had created the film studio development plans from 2004, 2009, and 2020, 23. Um, helping with our creating better jobs for our community. And um, I am also a teacher of the film industry and actors, and I've placed them in a lot of jobs and works, not just in front of the camera, but behind the camera. Um, I'm for the First and Second Amendment. I want to help with the water issue here. I am actually dealing with a, a, a big company right now that we're doing that. Um, I'm involved with cracking down sex and human trafficking. I have helped to take down a sex trafficking ring in Kihei. And we also uh, have gotten arrested a couple pedophiles. Uh, I believe in community safety, not just in our infrastructure, um, but for possible future disasters in helping keeping our electricity on and, and all that. But anyway, um, I'm here to help with our community and economic opportunities and creating better jobs like I have in the last 21 years. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Aloha and good evening. I'm Teresa Amato. I'm honored to be your state representative. Thank you all for participating tonight. As a kid, I paddled at Kihei Canoe Club, went to St. Anthony, and worked in my family's small business. As a small business owner and single mother, I raised my four kids here and delivered food to families while also volunteering for many environmental organizations. I refuse all corporate and lobbyist donations because you deserve a representative who is working for the people, not big corporations. I stand by my record. I have been working to amplify your voices, to protect our community, our environment, and our small businesses, and our way of life on Maui. I brought in an extra $63 million in capital improvement funds for Kihei for affordable housing, education, and flood and fire mitigation. We passed the largest income tax cut for families in Hawaii's history, medical GET exemption, laws to prevent gun violence, and supported fire survivors. We passed legislation making it a felony to improperly raise funds after a disaster. Lily, you may want to look at HB 2072. I was a proud primary introducer of a law to protect reproductive freedom. I am a hardcore Democrat. I will stand up for your rights. We just broke ground on 117 new low-income senior housing units in Kihei. I brought, brought in $6 million for Kihei to mitigate flood and fire threats and worked with colleagues to get $45 million to buy the Haggai, reserving 25% for teachers. My thanks to Senators McKelvey and Hashimoto for their contribution on this excellent project. We also funded the Hula May First Time Home Buyer Program and I fought for legislation to get a $70 million federal match to build a Maui veterans home. And I'm working with our state homeless coordinator to cut Maui's homeless population in half by 2027. 
I look forward to answering your questions tonight and especially contrasting democratic values with MAGA election denier opponents. Mahalo. All right, we're going to start the questioning with Lily. Okay, first question, here we go. Certain South Maui state facilities require significant maintenance improvements. The Kihei boat ramp is a perfect example. What facilities would you focus on improving during your term? Well, there is quite a lot, to be honest with you. Um, our infrastructure to build the immediate future with digital, which includes um, safety sensors and everything else to detect you know, the different types of heat that they're already doing, and we've started that with a, a Korean firm, actually. Um, so building, I mean, it's just not one area of Kihei. It's, we're entering into the digital world of safety and security. So my goal is, because I have, um, experience in metropolitan development with um, commercial real estate as, like I said, I've helped with my former boss, Tamio Iwata, who's a well-known broker, um, met um, Everett Dowling, the Goodfellow Brothers, you know, Darvin Lease, and so my knowledge in helping to develop a better infrastructure for our community to be safer in the future and to last for the next 50 years, if not more. I don't have a specific. Well, I, so place. actually, my, my question, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, my question is, is really focusing on what state facilities would be on your agenda. I mean, we both know that the Kihei boat ramp is a disaster. And so I'm, I'm really, I mean, and if, and if, um, if I'm asking you a question that you, know, you really haven't prepared for, I understand that, but really what I want, the question is to focus of attention is, are there any state facilities, state facilities that need attention that would be on your agenda for next term? Well, besides- um, In South Maui. <laughs> <laughs> That's like I said. I. I That's fair. I, 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 it's okay. Um, That's fair. I'm. I, I'm not going to hold it against you. <laughs> you know. Um, uh, you know. Thank you. Yeah. No, I'm not prepared for. Teresa, you want me to read the question, question again? No, I've got it. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you, Bob. So. You know, there are so many facilities that really need attention, it's hard to just pick one. But let's start with our schools, because they are state facilities and they need a lot of attention. That's why I fought hard to ensure that we could get 13 more DOE positions for teachers. It will be spread across the state, but South Maui will benefit. I fought to bring in money for a special edu education classroom in Kihei. Our state facilities, a mechanic carrying capacity is essential to ensure that we are protecting the environment and not overloading our beaches. There are many different facilities that need attention. The Kihei boat ramp is most certainly one of them. That's a safety concern as well. And I'm happy to talk to you about it more so that I can make sure it's on my CIP list for next session. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I'll be happy to follow up. Thank you, please yeah. do. <laughs> okay. Um, this question, we're going to go to Therese, okay? Ready? Thanks. People have talked about diversifying the South Maui economy for many years. Both South Maui, but South Maui is still heavily reliant on tourism. Do you have any legislative goals that are focused on diversifying the South Maui economy? Absolutely. Tough, tough question. It's an important question, and I'm going to be honest, it comes up every two years. And it's a no-brainer. 
But to diversify, we must invest in education. This increases opportunities to develop other industries and have people go into other jobs besides tourism. 30 states have free community college. It's time we do that and even more for our community. I want to provide vocational training and also free college education for those who train to fill current shortages, including teaching, healthcare, and other fields. I support free tuition for those who choose to remain in Hawaii working in such fields for a, um, for a year or so minimum following graduation. I also support increasing four-year programs on Maui so our students don't have to leave their families to get an education. I met with UH President twice, the local Dean Louie, and the Board of Regents just about four weeks ago. There is a lot of resistance from UH, but I'm gonna keep working on this. We owe it to our community to give them the tools to succeed, and Maui needs its fair share of resources, and that's my job. You hear who recommends farming fish like they do in Mexico. However, I'm on the fence on that one. Additionally, I support credentialing and licensing efforts for apprenticeships in conjunction with unions and UH departments to obtain buy-in for apprenticeship and credit requirements. I was thrilled to learn of the, the uh, apprenticeship program that they're doing up at the charter school, the trade school that they're doing. It will help provide many more opportunities for Maui's people. Finally, we've poured millions into UH to train more healthcare workers. We have funded new nursing programs, and we've forgiven some student loans for doctors, at least to help expand and stabilize that industry. But there is much to do, but I believe the key is education. Thank you. Okay, well that's, that's commendable. Uh, that's, and and, and I, see, I see exactly what your focus there is. My question, though, has more to do with, I think, how do we deal with the with the overwhelming number of I mean, tourism is in many ways defoling our island, and, and and people are concerned about it. And I and and I understand your question to say we can diversify by helping people get new get get better education. But my question really has to do with is there anything that we can do to limit the number of tourists? To, 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 is there any, anything that we can do to basically help us from having all these people here in a way that sometimes isn't very good. So to start, I think that we really need a carrying capacity study to see what each island can actually support when it comes to tourism. That has not been done yet. I, with the senator, we've tried to do that. Unfortunately, we didn't get it through. But that is something we continue to work on. We also need to limit uh, it has to be realistic, and, but we must be cautious. We must preserve current jobs at pre-fire levels without increasing tourism because we must not kill the golden goose. So I think that we can find a middle ground approach that preserves jobs, yet limits the amount of tourism that we currently have. Excellent, okay, thank you. Lily? As far as um, diversifying, in our opportunity, uh, economic opportunity. I have already been working on that with the film industry. Um, as I mentioned, I am a teacher. I was teaching, uh, actually had planned to be teaching at UH Maui with my program, but the pandemic happened. And I started doing Zoom classes that became very successful, and I'm still working with UH Maui in getting that done. I've also, uh, created, like I said, the development plans for the studio so that students can learn on the job as intern, interning um, and educating them in biotech as well, technology. Those are the jobs of the future for our, our kids for better paying jobs. Um, I always have to be up on my technology because I'm in the film ministry and I'm a realtor, so we have to evolve with everything. So I'm already doing that as far as creating jobs and the economic opportunity and other, um, to add on to our tourism because of what has happened. We're already going towards the technolo technological, you know, digital age, and it's just training. And I had spoken to uh, Gene Zaro at Charter, Kihei Charter School. So we're already working on some 
planned back there for a studio. So, so just recently, for example, mm -hmm. um, the city of Juneau, Alaska, held an initiative to limit the number of cruise ships and tourists that could arrive, and it won't. Should we be doing something like that? Um, I have dealt with a lot of the cruise ships. I was a demo assistant. Um, as far as I, I believe that we should have. You know, that would be nice to have our cruise ships coming in. We have to uh, my, 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 my question: the cruise ships was just an example. Oh, okay. The question: the question is, should should we be asking the people that live here that they, that that we should limit the number of tourists that come here? Absolutely. And how, we gonna, yeah. and how would we do that? Surveys, meetings, town hall meetings, um, just talking to everybody about their concerns. And I mean, I, it, there's nothing like you know having a, you know town hall meetings to hear. So Hawaii doesn't have an initiative process. Do you think we should? That I don't know. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. Mm -hmm. Therese? I do think Hawaii needs an initiative why. process. Because, you know, people have a right to have their voices heard. And if their legislators as a body are not doing what they're asking for, the people should have the opportunity to get about something on the ballot to have their wishes expressed. So what, we, what, what so tell me, I mean, you are one of many, you know. I am what, one what, of 51. What, what, what has to happen to, to make that happen? So I believe to make that happen, we would need to have two-thirds vote in each chamber of the body. And I almost want to defer to our senator, but I think we would probably need I'm going to ask him the question, too. <laughs> I believe we would, we would need a constitutional amendment to make that happen, which requires two-thirds vote in each chamber for two consecutive sessions okay. in order to create a ballot initiative. And then, of course, people have to vote. And you know, we have the lowest voter turnout in the state, the lowest in the country. I think it was 22% in the primary. That's something we need to fix. Okay. Thanks very much, both of you. Thank you. And back to Lynn. Should there be term limits for state legislatures? Absolutely. S such as for the governor and city councils? Go ahead. Yes. Tell me why. Other than the obvious reason. <laughs> yeah. um, I believe that a lot of these politicians, and like I said, I, I never wanted to get into politics, um, haven't done their job and they're not working for the people. And there's been a lot of corruption, you know? Um, so we gotta weed out. And I think term limits, everybody, it's definitely, sorry, I, I can't, you know, eloquently explain why. But so, so, so what you're saying is, is an alternative to voting those people out, mm -hmm. is that you would term them out, correct? Yeah. Right. Therese? Yes, I am a firm believer in term limits. When I decided to run for office, I knew it was not meant to be a career. It was merely my opportunity to do my public service for my community and then pave the way for the next generation. So in my office, I hire young, bright, upcoming law, uh, environmental law students who have interest in politics to train them, to help guide them to be the next step because it's not meant to be a career. It's meant to be, I think, the gentleman farmer goes to Washington to do their duty, and then they get the hell out of there and they go home. So for me, yes, I believe in term limits. I think if you're at the state level, 10 years is probably the right amount of time to do a good job and then get out and take the way for the next person. It creates more fresh new ideas. So again, you're one of several, or many. How, how does this happen? Uh, there would be much resistance. I know at one point, there was success in creating term limits, and then it was quickly overturned the next session. So um, 
it would be a challenge, but it can be done if people are willing to really lobby their legislators and all the members in office to make it happen. And yes, if we increase voter turnout, every two years you have the opportunity to make someone retire. Got it. Thank you. All right, Therese, you're up. Oh, this was, uh, I like this question. Um, <laughs> I'm scared. <laughs> Does your 2025 legislative agenda include a proposal and solution to the homeowners insurance financial crisis that we're all experiencing? I am so glad you've asked this question. Well, I'm so glad you're going to answer it. <laughs> it's an issue I've actually been working quite extensively on since the fire anticipating this problem. So, I mean, we've seen an immediate 800% increase in wooden frame construction insurance rates. Housing is already too expensive, yet some people are receiving demand letters of $5,000 or more, and many are seeing a 60% spike in HOA fees. This will likely translate into at least a 15% increase in housing costs. And I just want to mention I'm so honored to be endorsed by the Realtors Association of Maui. Some neighbors may lose their homes, others will have to move. I'm extremely concerned about this. So I've actually taken numerous steps with Senator McKelvey, anticipating that this would be a, a problem after the fire. We submitted an insurance regulation bill. HB 2189 would have established rate making regulations for insurers who based the rates on wildfire risk. Our protective bill, unfortunately, was not heard in committee. Not willing to stop there, I did more. I, I spoke with Insurance Commissioner Ito of the DCCA who oversees the white insurance industry three times. I spoke with the now former Speaker of the State House twice and with our governor to discuss the problem. In April, Commissioner Ito said House Bill 2686 should help fix this and as a backstop, he could activate the Hawaii Hurricane Relief Fund and raise the $400,000 cap on, on the Hawaii Property Insurance Association. To 750,000 and allow them to do commercial insurance as well. It seemed like maybe that was a little progress, but that bill died in conference with the Senate. Also, many housing complexes exceed 100 million. So there's more work to be done. Um, I'm not standing by and doing nothing. I mean, we put some legal solutions to the governor. It should have been a special session, but then he had risk about other things, so he decided not to do a special session. So we will have to come back and revisit this next session. Thank you. So, to be specific, are you going to draft any legislation? I have legislation that I have drafted with Senator McKelvey, and we will be reintroducing it. Okay, and give me give me the Reader Digest version. What's it going to say? Uh, the re I could pull it up on the Capitol website of here. That I think it'd be, it's, it's not a light read. It's a heavy read. I'd be happy to send it to you. But essentially, it establishes rate-making guidelines for insurers who, who base the risk on wildfire. So it would limit what they can, what essentially what they can charge. Okay. Uh, um, and maybe I'll get to you in a minute. So... <laughs> In the, in the condominium project where I happen to reside, our, our, our insurance premium went from $150,000 a year to a million four. Okay? Yes. How are you going to fix that? I mean, you're not alone. Yeah. So, um, it's a big challenge. I know the governor convened his working group, but it's not good enough. We really needed a special session this summer. Unfortunately, I just could not get the governor to move on that because he was concerned about other other things he was working on. So um, we, it's a serious problem. I've been meeting with the former Speaker of the House as well as the hopefully incoming new Speaker of the House. Okay. And she's concerned about this too because it affects her community on Kauai. Okay, thank you. Lily? Uh, I haven't really gotten into uh, this aspect of this. All I know is that I wish I had someone to help me write my speeches and answer <laughs> all that. But okay. um, being a realtor, um, I do know the problems that we face and are facing. And I have a lot of friends that, like I said, I'm not a homeowner. But 
you know, I do have massive amounts of friends that are suffering from this whole situation in okay. defense of the fire. All right. Lily, this is your turn. This is to my understanding now. The House of Representatives has appointed a commission tasked with improving government transparency through ethics and lobbying reforms. What will you do to ensure accountability at the legislature and should the Sunshine Law apply to the legislature? I am all for transparency and truth and trust, gaining our trust for our, you know, from our constituents. Um, like I said, I am new to this, but um, however it takes to be transparent. Sorry, excuse me. Apologize. No worries. It's all good. I just want to say I was proud to support many of the Foley Commission recommendations. We passed a number of very good laws the past couple of sessions to really address this. And I'm the only legislator who actually has tried to put cameras in my office so the public can actually tune in and see what goes on. The risk with that, however, is that my office deals with a lot of sensitive information from constituents. They'll call and give me their personal details. And we most certainly can't have that going out on the web. But I believe in transparency. And as a supporter of the Foley Commission recommendations, we are actually working as a majority body at the state legislature for next session to address more public transparency bills. It will be one of the key focuses of the majority package, I believe, next session. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. All right, we're going to do closings. And we're going to start with Therese. Friends and neighbors, you know I refuse all corporate and lobbyist donations because I work for you, not big corporations, and I'm not for sale. I obtained funding to prevent fires and floods, supported marijuana legalization, and marriage equality on your ballot this November. Housing fire survivors, we funded teacher raises for food for kids, improved health care for Kapuna, and better pay for health care providers. I focused on affordable housing while per preserving our environment, standing up against those who tried to bypass state oversight. This earned my endorsement by the Sierra Club and others. My core values of protecting families, women's rights, our economy, and small businesses earned my endorsement and support of over 20 organizations and unions. Too many to list here, so please go to my website, www.tomato.org, to learn more. You have a choice between Democrats and the two election-denying MAGA Republican opponents here. When Republican candidates use the word freedom, they mean freedom to take assault rifles to schools and churches, freedom to falsify and overturn elections while pretending to be patriots, freedom for corporations to pollute your air and water, and freedom for the government to invade your privacy, your bedroom, and to police your reproductive health care. When I talk about freedom, I mean freedom to grow the middle class, to love who you choose, freedom to have a home and get an education, freedom for a keiki to choose their own books and to go to school free from gun violence, freedom to have peaceful transitions, transitions of power, and especially freedom to make decisions about your own body. Let me be clear, to any Republican candidate who would dehumanize women by saying that government has the right to act as a reproductive police, no, mind your own damn business. We are not going back. I'm honored to be your representative. Please come see me or Dr. Joe tonight to sign up and let us put a sign in your yard. And go to www.tomato.org. Mahalo. Thank you, everyone, for um, listening to me. Not experienced with this, but I represent. Um, I'm not for allowing minor children to have to 
to have puberty blockers, you know, um, gender surgeries, uh, day after pills. I, I worked for an OBG fertility. I, I worked in the medical industry, so I have a lot of knowledge with science and the development of the brain. The brain is not developed until you're 25. And to allow our minor children to make these decisions without and not get parental approval for these horrible you know, situations of what this bill was introduced by Therese. Um, it's, it's just terrible. Um, I am for the First and Second Amendment. I believe that we shouldn't be censored with what's going on now, especially. I have a lot of friends that have been censored just for posting that you know, religious symbols are, so, I mean, like I said, we're, we're heading into communism. And my main concern too is the protection of our community, especially when we go and we're in the precipice of a war situation and the safety and protection of our community means everything well, to thank, me. Thank you very much. Thank you, ladies. so much to the Kihei Association for having us here tonight. So excited to see so many of you in the audience that I know. Um, many of you probably already know me. I'm Sheila Walker. And I see my neighbors from Maui Meadows. I see friends from church, from Calvary Chapel. And I recently started attending the Reshade group. And so I see friends from Reshade also. So it's so exciting to see everyone here. I also participate in the Lahaina Restoration Foundation and the West Maui Gover uh, Improvement Foundation. 
and I don't see anyone here from that organization just yet, but I also participate in the Boy Scouts here in Maui and the Hui Art Center. So that's just a little bit about how I'm involved in the community. And I've been attending countless, countless meetings, um, as I'm sure many of you have too, because I recognize you from the meetings here on Maui and walking the neighborhoods talking to all the people who live here and listening to what they're saying. And what I'm hearing from the neighbors here in Kihei is that they have um, excessive crime in their neighborhoods, which what? is new. And they have intersections that they feel are dangerous, which is new. And I'm hearing that even the street lights are out and they are telling me about it and asking me if I can fix them. And I'll say that even though some of these issues aren't part of my jurisdiction, I will use my influence and I will work full time, not just four months during the legislative session, to make sure that your concerns are heard and addressed and that solutions are put into motion. I will communicate with you regularly through email, social media, and town halls, and I will always put the people of Maui first without any excuses. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Angus, thank you so much. Aloha, everybody. Thank you so much for being here tonight. <clears throat> I'm Angus McKelvey, and I've had the great honor of serving you for the last two years as your state senator. <clears throat> this has been probably the most trying time for this community <clears throat> that we've ever seen in our lives. Because, as I said, right after the fires, the fires were like a nuclear bomb going off. And the, the contamination of things, everything from insurance to hyperinflation of the rental market, all of these things would spread to other communities. And unfortunately, it has. Through this time, though, working with my counterparts and others, we made advances. We were able to pull down about a billion dollars to help Maui, Lahaina's fire victims, both with temporary housing, as well as infrastructure funding to the county to be able to repair the infrastructure. Working together, we've been able to get Halakal Ranch with funding to put in the Axis Deer control. We've been working to get the North-South Connector Road going and ensuring that once the raised grant for Lapoa Street Extension was secured, I want to thank KCA for their work on trying to work with the individual homeowners with those issues on the North-South Connector Road. And there's much more. So much more needs to be done, but I think what really we need to do is to push and ensure that we can get behind the people home so the Kihei community isn't so overstressed. And believe me, they want to go home. They want to go home. There's a lot of trying challenges issues, and I'm here for you. They're, the only agenda I have is to see our community move forward together and tackle these problems, which a lot of them are way bigger than us, in a way that we can all move together and see results. That's pretty much it. I'm here to serve you. I thank you so much for everything that you are doing. And I want to thank Casey and everybody here who gave up themselves to the fire survivors and continue to do so. It means so much to me. And all I guess I can say is thank you for this honor. And I hope that you will choose me to represent you again for the next four years in what will be trying times. Thank you. Thanks, Angus. Thank you very much. All right, Shirley, we're going to start with you. Okay. Sheila, I'm sorry. South Maui is slated to experience significant housing growth in the next several years. What South Maui infrastructure improvements will you require as a condition for this growth? Excellent question, because we have so many developments going on right now. We have uh, the, uh, let's see, where can I start? There's three different major developments down here in McKenna that, um, that need to be supervised and overseen. The lead core, the Maui uh, McKenna development, and the 670 project. All of those projects are uh, in the works and probably going to come forward. And if we can demand that they supply the infrastructure we need, I'm for letting those, some of those developments go ahead. But there's a way we can negotiate them 
to uh, help them, or to, for them to help us with our infrastructure. So they say, that especially the, um, the McKenna development says that they will put in the, uh, some roads, they will fix some of the roads, but we have to build it into their package that not only are they gonna fix roads, they're gonna build schools, they're going to uh, supply more fire trucks for our firehouses, and they'll help um, create the roads for fire exits out of those areas, because right now, without the proper infrastructure, there's no reason why we should develop those areas, because we're just gonna put us, uh, that'll just put us in a trap and not help our community. So if we can negotiate with them to rebuild or build and shore up our infrastructure, then, then we should take a look at those developments more seriously. But we should hold their feet to the task. I mean, they have to pr give us something back, not just uh, provide uh, million dollar condos. Okay, here, here, excellent. You're preaching, you're preaching to the choir. But here's the question. The Planning Commission, the Council, the Planning Department, are all supporting these projects. What are you going to do about it? How are you going to, you want to negotiate with them? Where do you get to negotiate with them? I, I hope you can. The public has a voice. We may not have the votes, but we have the voice. So we have to speak up, and that's one thing I will do is motivate the public and our community to stand up. Okay. A fair comment, but, but unfortunately, people don't care. It really is true. I mean, it's, I'm sorry to say that, but it's really very difficult. I mean, those of us who know, hang on a second. Those of us at the KCA work on this every day, every day. I'm very familiar with every one of those projects and very familiar with the negotiations that we try to impose upon them. We testify before the Planning Commission and the Planning Department. We get nowhere. Now, I understand that, that this needs to be done, and I understand that you feel very strong about that. I guess my concern is, from Honolulu, how do you affect that? more community involvement, so motivating the people. And I honestly believe that people aren't aware of what's happening, so they need more communication directly so they're aware of what's going on. If, you, if we only knew that the, the 670, uh, they originally said that they had their own water system, they were gonna drill wells and have their own water. Now they're saying that they wanna rely on the county water, so they're gonna deplete our water system. Where in the contract did that, that fall short? How did that happen? Someone's not holding their feet to the fire. So if they commit to drilling the wells and providing their own water, they have to stick to that. And so we need to use litigation against them if they're not sticking to their word and providing the infrastructure that they say they're going to do. Okay. Angus, your turn. Yes, sir. Can you repeat the question? Pardon me, sir? Can you repeat the question? Sorry. Of course I can. South Maui is slated to experience significant housing growth in the next several years. What South Maui infrastructure improvements will you require as a condition of this growth? Well, it's really important to know, and you've alluded to it, that the state's role in approval of these projects is limited to the Land Use Commission, which is over 15 acres. And a lot of these applications that come in are purposely kept under that threshold to avoid the LUC, but land right in front of the Planning Commission and the County Council. And that is the closest form of government. I'm glad to see, you know, my friend over there, Kelly King, and others on the council, because that is where developer agreements can be applied. And this, what the state can do, those two things. One is to prioritize infrastructure to support this growth, if indeed it's coming online with the county. But the developers, to Sheila's point, need to go ahead and put in this infrastructure beforehand. Mm -hmm. Condition precedent, you're an attorney, you probably know that term very well. A condition precedent for any development would have to be infrastructure on their dime. We don't want to end up like West Maui with a bunch of deferred development agreements, right? Do we want to end up like, no, we don't. And so that's the way we can really apply it. One of the things we can do at the state level besides North-South Connector Road is to really look at, and this is where their contribution would be important, and a mechanism to do it from Honolulu, even though we don't have control, is called a resolution. 
a message aimed directed at the county and the planning commission of what policy wishes of the community is expressed by the state legislature. And that's where we put that in there. I think we need to look and aggressively move the key hay bypass idea, which has been sitting on the books way too long, and get that a reality through a segmented rolling construction approach. And I think through all of those things, we at the state level can put the, the pressure in them, convince them that you need to work with the community. Infrastructure has to go first. Real quickly, I know I'm running out of time. I'm a firm believer we build and develop infrastructure, and then we make developers build where the infrastructure is. We don't let them wander off and create, because guess what? We have to follow with billions of dollars to create infrastructure. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Angus, your turn. Um, you, you, you've heard these questions already, but I'm going to do it again. <laughs> Certain South Maui state facilities require significant maintenance improvements. Go to the Kihei boat ramp and take a look. What facilities will you focus on improving during your next term? We need to focus on all of them. Um, I've already laid out the idea of getting the Kihei bypass going again, and there are opportunities through segment approach. The Kihei boat ramp, to your point, you're right, it's become an absolute mess down there. I think in the Kihei boat, first of all, the governance of our small boat harbor system is ridiculous. I've put in bills several times with my colleagues to look at moving the harbors back to the Department of Transportation. In the case of Kihei boat ramp, maybe the county is in a better position to run it. Yeah. That being said, I've been talking to the Kahulavi people because there's a potential for a public nonprofit partnership to bring needed resources to the Kihei boat ramp. Mm -hmm. They have they're trying to work on developing a community center near the boat ramp. They've been very supportive of trying to engage in this partnership, and this is one of the ways that we can get the Kihei boat ramp the attention it deserves while we try to force the governance issues. And again, we're going to pursue CIP aggressively, but we also need to multi-prong everything because that's what it's going to take to get our infrastructure in mind. Real quickly, I talked about the, the Kihei Bypass, uh, talked about the no, North-South Connector Road, those are infrastructures. And one of the things, I know it's a county issue that we need to do, is we need to work with the county on creating a strategic mapping plan of the infrastructure in South Maui because the infrastructure is failing. We're cleaning seawater. We have sand in our systems, and guess what? All of that costs money to process. And so a strategic plan on infrastructure at the county level, working with them, maybe more revenue bonds like we did in Lahaina to support them, can be a way that we can address our infrastructure issues, especially when infrastructure fails, our environment goes with it. So I hope that answers your question, sir. Well, thank you so much. Um, I, I just have a quick follow-up. Um, so, I mean, there are many of us who are you know, completely mystified about where we are with the, with the collector road. Where are we with the collector road? Well, we got a raise grant. For, when the county and the feds really did the work, the state came in to support the raise grant for the Lofoa Street Extension. The hang-up, from what I understand, and you're probably very well aware of it, is with the property owners on the north-south connector road who have been, un, I guess, difficult in getting the easements from. I'm glad to see there's effort to perhaps look at condemnation to get those. Hopefully it won't be an eminent domain action, it will remain a condemnation, but to get, once we can, from what I understand, we can get these easements done, we can get the construction of that segment going. North South Collector Road is a county project. We were there to help with the funding. We're there to help with this issue. But again, the county council and the county are the tip of the spear. And so with their help in leading the charge, we can hopefully be able to. And, and, and forgive me if I'm, incorrect about this but I, I i was led to believe that there was like a like a 12 million or 25 million dollar grant that the race grant yeah but but i also was told that it will expire by the end of this year mm, i'm not aware of that at all no i don't think so and it okay. can be extended um, but again we got to work on what is actually causing the hold up okay right <laughs> no, no i understand preaching to the choir <laughs> okay show our communities deserves better. We deserve better public parks. Our boat ramp definitely deserves to be upgraded. We need our community centers upgraded and um, even little things like bike lanes. So certainly all of those things throughout Kihei are in disrepair and need to be worked on. So um, I would implement everything that Senator McKelvey is talking about if I were in office, because I believe in supplying these types of amenities to our community. You're asking for it, and we're gonna go about it in any way we can 
using our connections, raising funds, and getting it accomplished. So I would follow up on all the avenues that have already been initiated to get those things put in place as well. Okay. Thank you. We, <laughs> we deserve better. <laughs> you, yeah, I couldn't agree more. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, let's see. Sheila, you're up for this one, huh? And again, you know the question. People have talked about diversifying the South Maui economy for years. But South Maui is still heavily reliant on tourism. Do you have any legislative goals that are focused on diversifying the South Maui economy? Absolutely, because there are so many opportunity zones here. There are many ways where we can diversify our economy. So we have to look at what's super easy to do first, the low hanging fruit. We have a technology park right up the street. The, uh, we, could, we could be the Silicon Valley of, you know, of, the, of Hawaii. So we could use that technology park and grow that into uh, positions and that would create more uh, income for our community. We could also diversify the tourism and use uh, something that's called medical tourism instead of traditional tourism, where we, where we would bring in more doctors, have more uh, hospital facilities, and do things like plastic surgery, facial surgeries, neck lifts, where the tourists come here for medical surgeries. They're still considered tourists, but they're not taking up our uh, tourist attractions. They're not going out in the water. They're not going on the boats. They're staying in their private little secluded rooms to have their medical procedures done. That would cover two things. We would get more uh, qualified doctors here on staff and then have more facilities. And then also, uh, it's, a, it's a type of tourism. And it's a high dollar type of tourism. So there's simple, simple solutions that if we would just look at them, uh, we, could, we could definitely diversify. And I think this, uh, the solutions are simple, but people are just not willing to implement them. The other thing I would do, I would create a, a Maui model for a permaculture course where we would be the incubator of a, a, a permaculture kind of ideal of how you can put together your, your property, a small home, and, and do it in a permaculture way. We could be the Maui model for that, and people would come from all over the world to study with the top permaculture instructors here on Maui. Okay, very good. I like, I like, I like the demo. That's a good idea. That's a new one. So, but here's my question. How do you do this in the legislature? What, 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 what has to happen in Honolulu as an initiative to make any of this happen? You know, the thing that I'm gonna rely on is making connections in Honolulu. So I am gonna rely on my relationships with people and making the connections and getting funneled into the, the right areas so that I, I will be able to have influence. And that's one of the things that I do well is network with people, make connections with people, and, and use that influence to accomplish okay. our goals. Great, thank you very much. Angus. Yes, sir. I'm not gonna do this to you again. Can you please repeat the question? God, As a trial know. attorney, you should be used to this. <laughs> <laughs> People have talked about diversifying the South Maui economy for years, but South Maui is still heavily reliant on tourism. Do you have any legislative goals mm -hmm that are focused on diversifying the South Maui economy. Mm -hmm. Diversifying the South Maui economy is critical to get beyond tourism, for sure. I mean, we've used the tax credit approach in the past for the movie industry, as was discussed earlier. One credit program we can bring back and look at is the dual use credit, which we sunsetted due to the recession before, but that's a perfect example of how to leverage the federal investment in the tech part that was discussed earlier. Businesses need an incentive to come in to be able to survive and grow. And th that is the, one of the areas dual use credit could be used to incentivize the growth of local business. Yes, sir. For those of us that have no idea what you're talking about, <laughs> why, don't you, why don't you tell us what it is? 
dual use means a credit that is given to companies who have contracts that are working with the federal government so they can go ahead and commercialize and bring their products out beyond the federal, the federal work that they're doing. That creates jobs. There's a company up there right now that's at the tech park that, stack, that tracks space junk all over the world in real time. And they're growing and adding positions. The addition of the Space Force campus will mean more jobs and creation. Working with a high-tech development corporation, we can revitalize the existing tech building that's up there the state has and expand on it. You, really, it's about a piecemeal strategic approach. The other thing to diversify our economy, which was brought up by my, you know, one of my friends in the ag industry, is we need to create and work with distributors and others to create longer shelf life so we can get our grown in Maui, made in Maui products to the market. We are sitting on top of a huge export industry if we can just simply use technology and others to create these kinds of delivery systems, subsidized supply chain you know, delivery systems, as well as to go ahead and to get Maui products out the door and working on the success of the commercial kitchen at UH and others, creating business to business recombinant relationships where the recess, the recess peanut butter effect, my chocolate, your peanut butter, we have a new product. Now let Using the technology and others, let's get that product to the mainland and others, and we can start to build that kind of small business. That's just one of many things I think we can do. And by the way, medical tourism is great. I thank Governor Green for bringing it up. Um, but of course, we need medical facilities to do it, and maybe that's something that with the Kia community we can discuss perhaps we visit some of the ideas from the past about medical facilities in the backyard. So what, what, do you, what do you have to do to get this tax proposal back on the table? Introduce a bill. Okay. <laughs> and? <laughs> introduce a bill, it gets referred to committee, we we'll go talk to the chairman of the committee to schedule a bill, show them that this is not only a model that will help South Maui and all of Maui, but a model for all other islands that are trying to diversify their economy from tourism, work to basically ensure that when it goes to the Ways and Means Committee that financing can be obtained through different sources, especially federal sources given the strain on our state budgets from the fire, that we can get, that's how we will basically not only pass an initiative, but fund the initiative. Okay. Takes call out, right? Great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And we're back to you, Angus. I'm going to ask you my favorite. <laughs> Does your 2025 legislative agenda, love your legislative agenda, include a proposal and a solution to the homeowners insurance financial crisis that we're experiencing right now? Oh, yes, it does. Um, I want to thank my counterpart, Representative Amato, for highlighting the bills that we introduced last session. I was disappointed that many of them didn't pass, but I think one of the things that's heartening to hear my colleagues say, boy, we screwed up in not passing these bills. Because what they were was a, look, a looking glass into other areas that were not alone in this situation. Misery loves company. We got a lot of friends right now because I just came from a conference in Oregon with other Western state legislators. Property casualty insurance is being alive. So how do we solve it? First thing we do, reinsurance. There's this lack of reinsurance is one of the reasons why rates are skyrocketing. There's a bill right now in front of Congress to do reinsurance at the federal level, and I'm going to be supportive of that through resolution. So we can do that. The other thing is to, I'm, and I'm going to announce it here, the Strength in Hawaii Homes Act, which I will introduce as a piece of legislation working with my friends, Republican and Democrats from other states, this is a way to have government use grant and federal monies to assist homeowners in improving and rebuilding and hardening their structures. And if you do so, if you go to international, the international uh, IBHB, International Building House Consortium standards, and you can implement them, then what happens is your insurance rates will drop because your risk profile is now dropped. That is one way that we can go ahead and address the issue. The other issue, the other thing too, again, is we need to pop, look, we, Florida and California are, had state solutions. The big issue there, and this is for us in Hawaii, is they're trying to push people out of the state solutions back to the private market where rates are skyrocketing and availability is shrinking. And closing the state solution and pushing people in the market where there's no availability basically closes the back door. We have our own state solution, HPIA, is lacking. I think we can expand on it and take the examples to make sure that our state solution that is there for homeowners will be something that will actually work for them and put pressure on the private market not to pull out. So those are some of the ideas. So what's the state solution? The state solution is, the state solution is HPIA, Hawaii, Hawaii Property Insurance Association, and it's basically a state-funded 
property insurance portable people can buy insurance. The problem with HPIA is limited coverage. The rates are very high. And the other thing about it is that that's why the reinsurance bill, which I introduced last year, is a critical component. Reinsurance, if HPIA has access to reinsurance, it can start to underwrite more properties at lesser rates that people can afford. And, and forgive me if I'm not accurate about this. I, I, is this sort of similar to what the, the governor's talking about, the, the hurricane fund that used to be out there for people? Yeah, that was, that was actually our idea for the session, using HHRF as a reserve. Because if you've got the reserve, then what happens is, is that insurance companies should and have to, and this is why we need a strong proactive insurance commissioner that's going to fight for consumers, that they will go ahead and drop rates and create and, and afford more affordability. But that's the state solution is a way to provide, but the state solution has to be affordable, has to be accessible. And I, I worry what I see in Florida and California because if you cut the state solution off and you put people back in the private market, then what happens is is what's happening over there, people are dealing with skyrocketing rates and private companies still aren't underwriting in certain areas. And, and that's the big issue. What's sad is these insurance companies are using the line of wildfire specifically to come to you and say, we're gonna give you an 800% increase in your insurance. And that's why I support the bill I introduced last year, which California did, which is to force the insurance companies to make public the modeling that they use for the, the rate setting. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sheila. And our, yes, exactly. And our attorney general should go after these insurance companies aggressively because I think that could make a big difference as well. To, to, to not allow them to raise their you rates need a cause like of that. action. There's no so, cause of action. That's when insurance company comes. Oh, well, it, okay. They, uh, no, it's, it's true, but also, um, and the HBIA, maybe this is similar, but I know when my family business was being priced out of insurance, we decided to self-insure. So we put together a package where we've, we've been self-insured for 30 years now, because back in the early 80s that we were getting priced out and we couldn't do business because it was just too expensive and, and the, the costs were just through the roof. So uh, every HOA needs to look into doing some sort of self-insured thing and, and, and look to the long term. Wait, 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 I'm in charge of this. Okay. <laughs> you know? Sheila, you should be talking to us, sweetie. Um, Not yet. So, no. Sheila, Sorry. you know, I mean, Sorry. We want to hear I, you. I mean, I think I told, I, you heard me say a, a little while ago what, what yes. we experienced at, the, at our, at our HOA. Mm -hmm. I, I carefully investigated self-insurance. It is very expensive. Mm -hmm. Very expensive. I don't see that as a solution, so I want to know what else you got. I don't have the answers. Angus doesn't have the answers. Our attorney general doesn't have the answers, and neither does Josh Green. But all I know is that we've got to keep at it. We've got to keep doggedly doing something to make this change because we're losing our community. They are moving. People are having anxiety attacks over this and leaving Maui, and they're going to leave Hawaii altogether. So everyone has to come together and figure this out and okay. figure out the solution. And the new Speaker of the House, she will be after this because this was what she ran on. This is how she got in her seat was because of this insurance, the condo insurance. So that's how she got elected. She's smart. She knew that uh, that one issue would get her elected. And so she's going to work at it. Is there anything that you can do as a legislator that would require your insurance commissioner to make rules that are more more stringent, more powerful, more more you know friendly to the public. That's an excellent question, and there should be something we could do. I don't know yet, but absolutely, that's what the commissioner is for, right? Yes. So let's go to it. Go ahead, Angus. Well, first of all, I have put specific proposals out there. Is this a problem that's bigger than all of us, but we're all, there are solutions that we're pursuing as states together. You know, but I think at the end of the day, we put a bill in to remodel the insurance commissioner's office and to make a more aggressive advocacy-based insurance commissioner like they have in California, instead of being playing patty cake with the insurance companies and agreeing to every rate increase that comes across the table, they need to be a more aggressive pro-consumer approach 
to make them understand that pulling out of the Hawaii market will come with ramifications. And that's something that you can get behind next term? Heck yeah. Okay. All right. Got behind the last, last session. All right. I'll bring it back. Okay. Let's talk about the, the uh, term limits. I guess you would favor term limits? You know, I'll probably not be a popular guy for saying this, but I am not kind of a fan. And I'm just going to lay this out to you, everybody. You may be the judge right here. The, th the thing is, is that right now, most of the representative senators come from where? Honolulu. Right? This way, I've seen this problem, this thing happen in other states. When you have term limits, smaller people, people from Maui, from Hawaii, you come in, you got your four, ten years, and you're out. What's going to happen is all of the chairmanships and positions are going to go to Oahu people by default. It's challenge one. Challenge two, which happens in California, is lobbyists and others bypass the reps and senators and go right to the staff and make all sorts. There's a story about how lobbyists came in and took a staff golfing and out to lunch because they can do that. Legislator wasn't even about why, because you'll be gone in 10 years. The staff won't be. We're going to work with them. And finally, the biggest thing is Freedom of choice, I'm sorry, I'm a hard for libertarian. Freedom of choice. The freedom to choose who you want, the freedom to choose who you don't want. We just saw the Speaker of the House lose his election. People, you know, people in Maui, people in Maui have basically shown a pension that they will throw the bums out. We have to always strive to be, to try to give the best service possible. You, the voters, have the ability to basically yank the chain at any time. So I, I think that hopefully these, the, these points will be taken in consideration about term limits not being a panacea. However, I understand that you know that you can't be in government forever. I'm so honored to be your state senator, but I ain't hanging out here forever. Guys. Come on, really? I got way more and more awesome things going out there. And you know, and it, really, what it really is is getting let's get young people. We saw this session involved and out and part of the process. And once they do, they get that taste. They will run and they'll keep running, and that's how change is effectuated. But that's just my concern. So, uh, just when translate. So I, I hear you saying that you think that that you know the the voters we, 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 the voters should be able to do what term limits would might otherwise do. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Sheila. So I do believe in term limits because that's the way our government was set up initially so that different people would have an opportunity to represent their communities and um, it doesn't surprise me that that my opponent would, would not like the uh, um, term limits after 18 years of, of being in his position but I think um, new ideas fresh energy and some enthusiasm would uh, would be important to uh, have new people in instead of continuing to stay in office forever and ever and ever and I understand that you won't stay in there forever and I've only been here for two years by the way, so. for this position yeah, so <laughs> right exactly so I no, I just think that there should be term limits okay all right excellent excellent all right Sheila I think this one's for you the House of Representatives has appointed a commission tasked with improving government transparency through ethics and lobbying reforms. What will you do to ensure accountability at the legislature? And should the Sunshine Law apply to the legislature? Yes, on the Sunshine Laws, yes, absolutely. I mean, we do have a Sunshine Law here in Hawaii, but it's probably not as strong as Missouri's or Florida's. So it could be strengthened um, and amended. And the ball I think ballot initiatives is one way to, to go for that and, and make it stronger because it helps empower the citizens. It gives them a voice. Um, it increases the participation in our community. So I think that would uh, be a positive thing. And it just creates more checks and balances. And that's what our government for the people, by the people, is all about. Angus, what would you do to ensure transparency? Continue to build on the work that we've already been doing. Um, the work we've been doing, part of the one thing is there's no more fundraisers held during a legislative session. We are working to ban all contributions during session. I don't take any money during session because of the perception that there's obviously a quid pro quo at play here. 
But I think as far as transparency too, is we need to, I'm a big, huge fan of Zoom. Zoom is now part and parcel of every hearing. In my hearings, when we do conference committees, one of the rules this year for conference committees, and yeah, you were there, is that we had to announce across the table publicly what the conference draft was, what is being considered, and what is being voted on. I think another thing that would help the public would be fiscal notes on bills, so people can understand the fiscal impact. That's a huge, a huge thing right there, as well as trying to ensure that all working drafts and committee reports and such can be seen beforehand, especially testimony. Testimony should be made available to the public as soon as possible without this embargo of timeline delay so people can see what is being put forward by everybody. Okay, excellent, thank you. All right, this is the last question, guys. Ready for it? Here we go. <laughs> yeah. If elected, what will you do to alleviate the critical housing shortage in South Mountain? <coughs> Well, I can tell you, I won't get rid of STRs, and I won't support that because there's no evidence that <laughs> that um, that states that removing the STRs will lessen any of the housing crisis. So I don't, uh, I don't think that is a solution. Uh, we definitely need to create more housing and some simple solutions would be to uh, lessen the permits on how the houses can be constructed right now our housing uh, the, the fema director suggested that it cost 900 dollars uh, per square foot to build a house here and i just think that's excessive i think we could build houses for much less than that especially if we're using uh, simple types of materials and single wall housing. So the permitting needs to be, uh, re and restrictions need to be reduced so that we could do single wall housing and small footprints. And that way everybody could afford to own a home and not just rent a home because the idea is getting people into ownership, owner occupied homes and, and not just renters. They'll take pride in their properties and they'll be able to build equity in their property and that creates a real sense of community here when you have ownership. So I think some of the simpler uh, constructions would solve that problem. And I'm keeping the STRs. Okay. Um, Angus, I know that you have a lot to say about Lahaina and all in the housing situation there. I just want to let you know this question has to do with South Mountain. No, I know that, yeah. Okay? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> no, I'm not. This is not going this is KCA. So, it is a, it, but this is a housing affects all of us everywhere on this island. Mm -hmm. The lack of affordable housing. Some of the things we did in the legislature this year was empower the county to expand the use of ADUs where appropriate, mixed use development, and what they call mixed use and also um, repurposing buildings from what was purely commercial into possibly residential. We passed three bills this year to allow the county to do that. That's a way for us to really be able to stimulate the creation of inventory within the existing structure. One of the things I'd like to do next session, and I've already talked to the realtors about this, is to put together a working group to identify properties and such which are basically in distress that could be acquired by the Hawaii Housing Finance Development Corporation for housing. The Haggai Institute was one of our initiatives we worked on. Why? Because it's quicker and easier to take what is already there and repurpose it than it is to build. Better to go brownfield than greenfield. And greenfield development takes forever and a lot of times runs into problems. So I'm hoping that perhaps working with the county, perhaps revenue bonds and other types of funding to incentivize landowners and commercial owners to and to rapidly embrace adaptive reuse and mixed use by giving certain incentives on fees and other things and perhaps expediting their permits in the permit line to incentivize people to come in on their own to want to do these projects. Because it's going to take really, inventory is going to be created by, you know, what's already there plus by developers. So. Well, that's a good question. So uh, is there anything that you can do, you know, as a legislature in Hawaii to in some way encourage, induce, whatever, the developers to provide workforce housing. I mean, we, I, you know, I know that there's, there's ordinance and ordinances in the county, ordinances involved, and it has to be a certain amount, and this, that, and the other thing, but it's not working, mm -hmm. I don't think. Mm -hmm. What can you do to help that? 
Well, yeah, they're, they're providing, this is a problem, they provide the workforce housing up front, but then what happens is, oh, people don't qualify for the financing. We saw this at Oklahoma Village. They don't qualify for the financing, and so even though they got the property awarded in the lottery, they fall out, and guess what? That property is now sold on the open market for retail. And all that, I've, I grew up here. How many times have we seen people come to the county council over and over again, we need affordable housing for this project? I've seen all of these projects are now all 100% market properties. So we need to ensure that when developers do this, that they are, one, going to extend the financing to those who win, the, who win these lots, right? And then they go ahead and they actually, they, this is in perpetuity. And I want to, you know, Sheila talked about the Nahali Community Land Trust, the land trust model is a great model because it provides a way for workforce housing that's built to remain in perpetuity. You're allowed to sell the property to realize some of the gains and investments you made in the property, but you're not allowed to make a loophole. And that's the model I really believe we need to expand on. So let me just translate. So if, if someone qualifies and they and they they, they, they purchase a, a you know a, a workforce house, that there would be some sort of condition in the deed that says it must remain that way in perpetuity. Mm -hmm. Is that right? That is correct, sir. Yeah. Okay. That's one of many mechanisms. It's a, it's a, there are no quick silver bullets. It's going to take a lot of lasers, a lot of different things, cutting and dicing and slicing from every angle for us to make meaningful changes. And that's why we need to embrace all of this. And one real quick thing I'll just point out if I may, while single wall construction may lead to a cheaper house, you might not be able to get insurance for it because it's now a risk building. So that's the, the thing is we need to try, this is why Strength of Hawaii Homes Act, I'll go back to that, is a way to generate housing too because of the fact that we're bringing in outside investment. Okay, Sheila, what do you think? Well, I think if California can offer no interest loans with no money down for the illegal immigrants to buy houses, Maui can figure out a solution as well. <laughs> Anyway, anything else? Disregard what he has to say. <laughs> You're out of line, sir. Thank you. Uh, well, anything listen, else that you'd like to say? Have some respect for the speakers. We're listening. Have respect for us because we want to hear from them. Thank you. Good job. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Sheila. moderator. Thank you. Sheila, anything else on the topic? I think I've said enough for now. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> I know. I know. So we're going to go to closing. Angus, you go first. First of all, I want to thank the Key Hate Community Association for putting this on. You know, the start of getting the community involved in things like this, where people can come out, exchange ideas, and ask questions, and challenge those who wish to represent them. So, and I want to thank all of you for giving me this wonderful opportunity to represent all of you in South Maui for the last two years. And even though I'm a Lahaina guy, I was in South Maui all the time since I was a little kid. I want to be able to ensure that as we this community grows, it grows in a way where what is special about Kihei and South Maui remains. We are not the mainland. We are Maui. And Kihei is a special gem in this place, whether it's protecting the environment, getting the resources for a school, and helping people tackle this ungodly insurance thing. It's all about one new thing. Working together to keep Kihei a special place this is all the reason why we're here. This is all the reason why we're here for Maui. The, the road ahead is difficult. There are no easy answers. But my commitment to all of you is this, to continue to work, explore, embrace new ideas, technology, partner up with our other colleagues in other states so that we can aggressively pursue these things. And the final thing I'm gonna say is that I will just continue to work hard to ensure that what this community needs to see and do and the discussions happen continue. There are no easy choices. There are no easy solutions. But you know what it starts with? It starts with a can-do attitude, and that's all I'm trying to bring here, is to say that we are going to work hard to do everything for the community. So mahalo again, everybody. Thank you for being here. Please get out and vote, no matter your flavor of tea. Go ahead and take it. But you know what? Get into the tea shop. Vote. Seriously, you know what really stinks? I'll just leave it this. When you see the voter turnout so low, guess what Honolulu does? Hmm. We can run this one right down there. So you guys, 
Get out, get involved, get involved, pick your horse, get out there, get to the, the bottom line is at the end of the day, the whole community rises. And my final plea is, let's just be good to each other. Yeah. All right, we need, to, we need to go to the other horse. <laughs> good. How many of you would like to see this original Aloha charm and the rich Hawaii culture remain here in Kihei? Yeah. And how many of you would also like accessible housing with abundant utilities and high paying jobs? Yeah. All of us, right? So we don't have to compromise. We can have all of these things right here in Maui and in Kihei. I will make sure that we don't sell out this beautiful island to the corporate interests or foreign investors who have little respect for our Aina or the people who live here. We have no time to waste. I will make sure your voices are heard and the urgency is now. I promise to communicate with you in a, on a regular basis with compassion and I will use common sense to find solutions in the legislature. Let's all take positive action and vote. Encourage everyone else to vote like Senator McKelvey says. I have the energy and the passion and the commitment to keep Maui no kaboy. Our Maui community must come first. No excuses. Thank you. Thank you. Let's, let's have a big round of applause for all of you. Okay. Um, you should all know that on October 15th, we will have another forum with the remaining council members who are running in November. Thank you very much for coming. We appreciate your help.